Aloha and good afternoon. Welcome to This Is Now. The Maui Fire Department presented its highly anticipated after action report on this on last year's wildfire devastation. More than 200 personnel from different agencies, including MFD, the Maui uh, Police Department and FEMA were interviewed for the report. Our Chelsea Davis joins us live from the Kula Fire Station with the highlights. Chelsea. Yeah, Dylan Nash, Maui Fire Department presented its after action report into the August 8th wildfires last year up here at the Kula Fire Station because they wanted to remind the public that not only were they battling the worst fire in our nation's history in more than a century, but they were battling the two worst fires in state history at the exact same time. And in addition to that, there are also two other major fires going on at the exact same same time as well. The Maui Fire Department Chief Brad Ventura said Maui firefighters did run out of water that day on August 8th, but he said that fire was so fierce and so out of control. He said water would not have made a big difference. He also said more firefighters would not have made a difference. And he said better training would not have made a difference. So our department does have a pretty extensive fire ground operation program that our firefighters all receive training in. When you talk about conflagration and an urban conflagration in dense areas such as Lahaina and that um, Lahaina Luna area, when you add the factors of the wind in, no training is going to overcome what they face that day. They are well equipped and trained to mo respond to multiple structure fires, which we have had in the past. But when you have that extent of weather and fire going on, um, as mentioned with some of our partners in CAL FIRE, you know, at that point it's really an evacuate all sort of a situation and kind of stop fighting the fire to save lives. The chief said normally there are eight to ten firefighters working in the upcountry area. He said on August 8th they had 39 firefighters working upcountry. He said normally they have 14 to 17 firefighters working on the west side. And he said on August 8th they had 54 firefighters working on the west side. The after action report lists 17 challenge areas or areas for improvement. And one of those improvements the chief pointed out was creating a communication plan incorporating different languages. The chief also shared stories of heroism. One included an off duty lifeguard who drove his moped into the fire to rescue people multiple times. He said there are countless stories like that and he said we'll probably never hear them all. 101 lives were lost that day, but chief said thousands of people were saved. Now this report did not include the cause of the fire. The chief said that will be coming out of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, commonly referred to as ATF. But chief said he did not have a time frame for when that will be released. But the full Maui Fire Department after action report is right now on our website. If you want to check that out, it's on Hawaii News Now. Com. Reporting live in Kula, I'm Chelsea Davis for Hawaii News Now. Chelsea Davis, thank you so much for that live report. As mentioned, you can find all the details of that report on our website, hawaiinewsnow.com. We want to turn now to some other news around the islands, including threats made at a local school. Another threat has forced Damien Memorial School to release students early today. There was a heavy police presence at the school this morning. In an email sent by school officials, they said a note threatening violence was found on campus and police were immediately notified. Damien went into lockdown and the school added that while there is every indication the threat is not credible, they are handling it with an abundance of caution. This is the second incident of this nature this week. On Monday, Kamehameha schools canceled classes because of a similar threat. HFD investigators are working to figure out what caused an overnight two alarm fire in an abandoned house in Waianae. It broke out at around 10.45 p.m. near Lua Lua Le Homestead Road. First responders had the fire out shortly after midnight. No one was hurt. Seven people were rushed to the hospital after a bad crash last night in Kunia. It happened at around 6.45 p.m. when a 41-year-old driver went into the opposite lane of traffic and head-on into a group of motorcyclists. 
We're told the group included 21 riders. And the scene was spread out over uh, probably one to 200 feet because the initial motorcycles were hit and then some of the other ones were hit. So there were patients kind of up and down this road that had to be tended to. Of the seven hurt, one was the vehicle's driver. She was seriously injured. One of the motorcyclists was taken in critical condition with Wahiwa General Hospital's emergency room closed. Ambulances took the patients to three different facilities. It's not yet known why the driver went into the wrong lane, but police do not believe speed or intoxication played a role. New at noon, the Waipio Peninsula, home to a more than 240-acre soccer complex, is no longer being considered as a potential future site for a new landfill. The city says the Navy notified Mayor Blangiardi last week that the Navy had concerns about the site's proximity to nearshore waters and the military's operations and training activities. With Mayor Blangiardi having already eliminated federal lands on the Wa'anae coast from consideration, and with federal lands in Waimanalo near Bellows Air Force Station also excluded by the military, the city says it will pursue other possible alternatives. Senate Republicans are trying to figure out a way to force Democrats in the Senate to take up the trial of Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas after he was impeached for his handling of the border. Natalie Brand has more from Washington. Impeachment managers made the ceremonial walk from the U.S. House to the Senate, delivering articles of impeachment against Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. I announce the presence of managers on the part of the House of Representatives to conduct proceedings on behalf of the House concerning the impeachment of Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security. Senators will be sworn in as jurors on Wednesday. Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he wants the issue addressed as quickly as possible. Impeachment should never be used to settle a policy disagreement. House Republicans accuse Mayorkas of not enforcing federal immigration laws and breaching public trust. Alejandro and Mayorkas's willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law has had a calamitous consequence for the nation. GOP lawmakers are pushing for a full trial in the Senate, but some say they're concerned Democrats could table or dismiss the charges instead. Immigration's one of the top issues across the country, and I think uh, Schumer's going to do everything he can to avoid having those folks take a tough vote. The politics of the issue was on full display as Mayorkas testified at a budget hearing Tuesday. The open border is the number one issue across America in poll after poll. And that is exactly why this committee impeached you. Secretary Mayorkas defended his department's work and made the case for more funding. With the uh, resources and the authorities that we have been provided, it is as secure as we can make it. To. The Biden administration calls the impeachment effort baseless and urges Republicans to pass legislation to help secure the border. Natalie Brin, CBS News, Capitol Hill. In a statement, Hawaii Senator Brian Schatz said in part, after reviewing the articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas, one thing is clear. There is no actual allegation of an impeachable offense as outlined in the Constitution. Never before has Congress sought to impeach and remove a federal official solely because of a policy disagreement. Without an allegation of an impeachable offense, the Senate should move to dismiss the articles of impeachment immediately. The U.S. Supreme Court heard 90 minutes of arguments today that could impact hundreds hundreds of defendants in the U.S. Capitol attack, as well as a case against former President Trump. Christian Benavides has more. The U.S. Supreme Court is considering whether federal prosecutors correctly charged more than 350 people at the January 6th Capitol riot with felony obstruction of an official proceeding. That includes former Harrisburg, Pennsylvania police officer Joseph Fisher, who petitioned the high court. His lawyer argued the government is using the obstruction statute as a dragnet. Until the January 6th prosecutions, Section 1512C2, the otherwise provision, had never been used to prosecute anything other than evidence tampering. The U.S. Solicitor General told the court there's no question Fisher and other defendants obstructed the process to count electoral votes. Yes, he obstructed that official proceeding. The terms of the statute unambiguously encompass his conduct. 
Justices probed the scope of the statute and if it could be used to criminalize other types of conduct. Would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, um, before a vote qualify? for 20 years in federal prison. More than 100 January 6th rioters were convicted under this law. If the court sides with Fisher, it could lead to new trials or lighter sentences. Former President Donald Trump faces the same obstruction charge in special counsel Jack Smith's upcoming election subversion case. Christian Benavides, CBS News, Washington. Day two of former President Trump's historic trial in New York is highlighting just how hard it can be to find an impartial jury. Trump is the first former president to face criminal charges. Michael George reports from New York. Former President Donald Trump railed against the charges he faces, returning to the courtroom in Manhattan Tuesday. This is a trial that should have never been brought. The presumptive Republican presidential nominee is facing 34 felony counts related to alleged hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels through his former lawyer Michael Cohen. Prosecutors say it was an attempt to cover up an alleged affair ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Trump denies any wrongdoing. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? More potential jurors were excused Tuesday, some after saying they could not be impartial. On Monday, more than 50 potential jurors were excused for that same reason. What this underscores is it's going to take time to choose a jury. I really wanted to be on the jury. <laughs> it would have been so interesting. Kara McGee was excused because of work issues. Honestly, after seeing the other jurors read the questionnaire and hearing how committed they also were to focusing on the evidence and, and focusing on the right to a fair trial. I actually do believe that he can get an impartial jury in Manhattan. This is the first of Trump's four criminal cases to go to trial and maybe the only one that sees a verdict reached before the November election. Michael George, CBS News, New York. A trio of new investigations are now underway to see who may be responsible for the deadly Baltimore Bridge collapse. This as two of the victims' bodies are still missing. Cole Higgins has the latest. Three weeks after a massive cargo ship struck Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge, authorities confirmed the body of a fourth victim has been recovered. Six construction workers who were working on the bridge at the time of the collapse plunged into the Patapsco River and died. Two of their bodies are still missing. They were living the American dream, fixing America's infrastructure. Out there just filling potholes, not knowing it was going to be their last day. Attorneys for the families of two of the victims and one survivor announcing they are conducting their own investigation into the bridge collision. The ship's owner and manager have filed a petition in federal court asking for a cap of about $43.7 million on potential liability payouts. Attorney Kevin Mahoney says the company's petition relies on an outdated law and is calling on Congress to repeal it. The limitation of liability Act was passed 173 years ago in 1851. That's about 20 years before Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Meanwhile, the FBI confirms the agency, along with the Coast Guard, has launched a criminal investigation into the bridge collapse, telling us, quote, the FBI is present aboard the cargo ship Dolly, conducting court-authorized law enforcement activity. The city of Baltimore also looking into who may be to blame for destroying the bridge that 30,000 Marylanders relied on every day. Anything that we can do to help Baltimore uh, recover from that tragedy. I'm Cole Higgins reporting. Some relief for travelers today out of Honolulu's airport. Issues impacting a screening system have been fixed. The problems at checkpoint three forced airport officials to advise flyers to arrive a full three hours before their departure time on Monday. We've been told today all systems are now up and running, but as always, you should check your flight status just to be safe. Rising seas are eating away at underground infrastructure here in Hawaii and globally. UH 
which Monoa researchers found cities with complex networks of buried and partially buried infrastructure have increased danger of corrosion and failure of critical systems such as sewer lines. Scientists identified over 1,500 low-lying coastal cities and towns around the globe that are likely experiencing these impacts. Waikiki was included. Salty groundwater is likely interacting with these really corrodible elements and it's um, corroding this infrastructure in a way that folks aren't keeping an eye on. Researchers say the study underscores the urgency for strategies to adapt and develop future construction plans. Well, there's a new opportunity for young girls to explore the world of science, technology, engineering, and math, more commonly known as STEM. Our Casey Lund shows us a new camp that recently opened on Oahu's North Shore. Well, this is where lifelong memories are made. We're at the Girl Scouts of Hawaii's Camp Palmalu, and it is more than just a camp out in the wilderness, although it is that. We're here uh, above Sunset Beach, way in the woods, and this is really a special place. I'm with a special person. Uh, Dr. Kanoe Naone is the CEO for Girl Scouts of Hawaii. I just want to talk a little bit before we get into all the opportunities here for, for just camp, making those memories. Or really what we're focusing on today is the SEM Center for Excellence, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Um, the, a state-of-the-art facility up there, which uh, we spent most of the day at. What is the goal of Girl Scouts of Hawaii trying to introduce those young women to STEM? Yeah, so how do we get more women into STEM with 16,000 jobs? every single year in the STEM field available in Hawaii, but only 25% of those jobs being filled by women and being filled by people from other places. Like how do we grow our own talent, keep them here, um, generate, yeah, generate those opportunities. And, and, and like when I say state of the art, uh, it's really cool up there. Uh, we have that topographical sandbox that adjusts to different changing uh, topographies. Um, this is a really, really unique place, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is glamping, like yeah. in this particular area. So, I mean, we can fit 60 here. And these are, I mean, of course, it's not like five star. It's, I say it's five star yes. camping yes. opportunities, maybe not five star hotel opportunities. I know Grace was like, you know, <laughs> thinking I wanted to show like this nice you know, a uh, porch that's enclosed. We've got a like clothesline here to hang up your towels. We have compostable toilets, rain shower. And showers. beyond all the opportunities for our Girl Scouts, our awesome Girl Scouts of Hawaii, this place could be used for corporate events. And that's another way you folks are able to bring in revenue, right? Yeah. Like as a nonprofit, we're always thinking about diversifying our funding stream. Obviously, everybody knows about cookies and cookie yes. is a significant portion of our budget and fundraising so that we can bring programs to girls, right? And have opportunities for them uh, but also like we need fundraising from other things like we have our women of distinction event coming up on september 6 at hilton hawaiian village um, but the opportunity to rent this out to companies and corporations like helps to just make us have a solid foundation very good and if you want more information on that uh, or the stem center for excellence and all the great work that you folks do and thank you for it uh, we have that online at hawaiinewsnow.com for now we'll send things back into the studio all right, thank you, Case. Here's a live look outside at Charlotte, North Carolina. The temperature there, 82 degrees. We're going to have a look at your local forecast here at home with Guy Hagi after this quick break.
How's it on this Tuesday? We're back to the best weather on the planet. And the good news is that it's going to linger for a while. That stormy disturbance is pulling away to the north and to the east. If anything, uh, the Big Island's got a few high clouds. Now, it's not going to be totally dry. We will have, over the next several days, a few windward and mulka showers, but rainfall totals will be insignificant and light. Now, the winds are on the way uh, to the north, northeast. So today, the winds will shift more to the north and tonight to the northeast. And that means it's going to be a little on the cooler side today. Still, though, with lots of sunshine. Temperatures will be getting into the low 80s for some areas and we'll have a, you know, a few windward and mulka showers mainly for those windward sides of Kauai and Hawaii Island. And as far as the surface still elevated for north and west shores, granted there will be a little bit of chop there for the north shores because of the northerly breeze, but the winds aren't strong enough to really cause it to be unrideable and the east shores are running one to three. Expected to get a little bit bigger when those trade winds pick up speed. So northerly winds today slightly cool, but still we're going to be very, very nice with lots of sunshine, especially for leeward sides. And over the next several days, with the trade winds holding firm, if anything, rain-wise, we'll have a few overnight and early morning windward and mulka showers. Otherwise, the best weather on the planet is here to stay into next week. Last night's WNBA draft was a coronation for Caitlin Clark. As expected, the University of Iowa star went to the Indiana Fever as the number one pick. And for the first time in nearly a decade, the draft was held in front of a live audience. Jan Crawford has more. The Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. And with that, it was official. Caitlin Clark going first in the WNBA draft and the league entering a new era. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs. Caitlin. At Gamebridge Fieldhouse in Indianapolis, Clark's future teammates and fans erupted when they heard the news. And with good reason, the Fever haven't had a winning season since 2015. Earlier in the night, WNBA fans packed the streets outside the Brooklyn Academy of Music, where the draft took place to show their support. I'm happy to see the women's game grow. The Los Angeles Sparks select Cameron Brink. Stanford star and 2021 NCAA national champion Cameron Brink went second. I just have to shout out all my girls. I'm so proud of all of us. Next was this year's champion from the University of South Carolina, Camila Cardozo, who now heads to the Chicago sky. I had a go to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> Angel Reese, the highly touted LSU player who won a national title in 2023, also went to Chicago with the seventh pick. What are you proud of that you've helped build in basketball right now? Being able to leave my impact. So many different people came out today and how they can relate to me. So a kid from Baltimore, not supposed to be here. Jan Crawford, CBS News. And in today's Good News Now, we're going to end with a funny cat video. Cats, of course, are internet sensations when they do something funny, but this one cat in particular went flying. He's being called the Michael Jordan of cats. CNN's Jeannie Mose has the details. We've done stories on an enormous cat and on a slap-happy cat slapping a judge at a cat show, but this blur across your screen... <laughs> This is the flying cat. Meet Remy, a Chicago area Bengal cat. <laughs> Two-year-old Remy went behind some hanging coats. His housemate, Lucy the cat, decided to come play. But when Lucy knocked a coat off the hook, Remy went bonkers. <laughs> Those immortal words escaped the lips of cat owner Julia Amade's boyfriend, Nick. The cat was fine. He landed on this. An interactive cat toy. Commenters were awestruck, saying, My cat has wings. They called him the Michael Jordan of cats. But I've never seen him get air like that in my life. The dog of the house, Maggie, was singled out online for her chill reaction. And just looks at my boyfriend like, there they go again. The stratospheric leap went explosively viral, and many labeled Remy the very definition of a scaredy cat. 
But Remy took being jumpy to a whole new level. Like Rocky, he's gonna fly. Genie Mouse, CNN.